two, one. Hello, Robert Heffernan, Manja.tv, Cooking Vamp 17. Super excited to be here with my ma. Uh, can I have a sound check? Can anybody hear me? Sound check? I can hear you. <laughs> my ma can hear me. Can anybody else hear me? Sound is good. Thank you, JR. All right, Cooking Vamp 17. I think I wore the number 17 once in football. Maybe uh, eighth grade, I was 17. Only time I ever wore the number. Seventh I was, grade, I take that back, seventh grade, go ahead. I was 17 once. Yeah, my mom was 17 once. <laughs> A long time ago. All right, so let's, let's dive right into it. What an opportunity that we have tonight to talk with somebody that has put a few meals on the table. Um, so Betty, Elizabeth, Ann Heffernan, tell me um, what, were, what year were you born? 1925. 1925, all right. Um, that makes you older than 17. A bit. I'm just six months shy of 90. She's in her 90th year. <coughs> all right, so tell me, Growing up, a few people that don't know the family, but you come from a family that had a farm. Yes, when I was about 12, I think we got the farm. And after that, uh, we lived on it every summer and all holidays. And uh, But in the summer, you know, I drove a team of horses and cut hay. And I got to go in the garden and uh, pick vegetables and pick apples off the tree. You want to know how bad I was? Tell me. We had to pick cherries. We hated picking cherries. So every year we broke a limb off the tree. So we didn't have so many to pick the next year. I would break my arm now if I did that. But those are the bad things that we do when we don't appreciate something. That's the that's a part of that story. I didn't appreciate so what I had. Did Did George Washington cut down a cherry tree? I've heard that story. All right, so you just broke cherry limbs. I just lim broke limbs. Just cherry <laughs> limbs. All right. So I, I guess the reason I asked that question is being from the farm, there's always been like a farm to table kind of natural thing for you. Right, absolutely. And it really does taste better. Uh, and I believe it's, well, especially today when they have all the chemical stuff, we didn't have any of that. We had some good horse manure or chicken manure that they put in the garden, but it tasted great. And it was so good that I would be picking beans and one in the box and one in my mouth and one in the box because <laughs> they were delicious. All right. All right. So I did, I don't know if you had any you out there know, but I, I'm a big believer that math is something that you don't set out to do. Math sneaks up on you. So I was sitting and I was wondering, come from a big family, 11 kids. My mom cooked dinner every night that I remember. I mean, a few there was a few KFC nights, of course, and uh, a few leftover nights. But by and large, cooked dinner for a huge crew. And I did a little bit of math. And I want to say that if you consider one person sitting down to a dinner, a mouth to feed, then my mom cooked over, she has fed over 100,000 mouths. <laughs> That's the math that I've come up with. And I think it's on the shy side. So putting together meals to feed 100,000 mouths, I think she knows uh, a little bit about food preparation for numbers. So I just want to ask you to tell the people um, maybe a couple of things that went into planning weekly, logistically, to feed that crew of people. Well, I only got to shop weekly because I already had, had to be home taking care of a kid or two that wasn't big enough to take care of themselves. So I shopped weekly and I would shop the specials in one of three different stores, three different stores. And I would kind of plan, well, no, I did plan ahead. We had pork chops one night, a lamb roast one night, uh, maybe ham one night. But we always had meat, potatoes, vegetable, salad, 
but not so much on desserts. I was so bad on desserts. We went to my mother's once and she had a cake and one of the kids said, whose birthday is it? <laughs> so that's where I was. But I, I really did have a full meal. And I really thought everybody did that. And everybody came home to dinner every night. And I think that was the case in when I was raising my family. I don't think it's so true today. But I think it was a good thing. And... Uh, and I'm glad I was able to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, th th there's no doubt that I ha have thought about and have read about, it, obviously, uh, the general health of families and how much generally they're healthier if you sit down to a meal every night. So thank you, Mom. That's, that's fantastic that uh, you were able to put those 100,000 meals, 100,000 meals. That's I mean, that's meals on wheels on steroids. <laughs> A hundred thousand meals? Are you kidding me? I think I'm more tired when you tell me than when I did it. <laughs> um, I just want to, because we talk about uh, building community with Manja TV, and, and obviously I think that sometimes the fact that we even have to talk about how you build community might be a, a sign of the times. So another thing that we talked about in Northfield, there were big families and there was a sense of community just in that little neighborhood uh, or that parish and share with us how, especially around food, how that developed. Well, the first thing that comes to mind when anybody was sick or had a baby or something, we all went together and somebody cooked every night for that family. And, and we would talk, what are you gonna fix? What am I gonna fix? But we always fix something. And then if we needed something, we didn't all have a second car to go to the store. So we would just go over and borrow from a neighbor. Right. Not quite as the same kind of borrowing my husband did, his mother did. They lived in bungalows and you could reach across. If you put a stick of butter on the stew, spoon, unwrapped, of course, and reach it across, then uh, his aunt who lived next door would take the butter. Or his mother would call and say, I need a cup of sugar. And they just passed it back and forth. And I think that's how people remain close and people really learn to take care of one another. I, that taking care of one another, I think, is really an important aspect of life that we've lost. All right, we haven't lost it. It's just kind it's, of, it's kind of fluctuating. Right, we're going to get it back. Right. That's what we're going to do. Right. And then sometimes the neighbor that lived across the street from me, she had a cellar and it was filled with everything. Anything you needed, you just called Mrs. Seisel and she would give it to you. Although Mrs. Seisel was very smart, she wasn't going to get poor on my borrowing because I <laughs> didn't remain, you know, thinking ahead all the time. So she kept a very good ledger down to the penny. I must say I was never that efficient, but but it was it was wonderful. And when we moved um, after 17 years, I thought I'll never be able to do this without Mrs. Seisel. I but, love I love the story that she tells because. Think of the times in the 60s and 70s uh, with the Cold War and there was always the fear of nuclear holocaust and if that were going to happen, they were going to go. They were going to go to their house in Lake Geneva. Can you imagine how how much traffic there's on the roads to Lake Geneva? I said, I'm not, I'm not stocking a thing. I'm just going to cross the street and go in their <laughs> cellar. It's well stocked. We're, so the Hefferton family plan was we're going to the Sisals <laughs> because their cellar is stocked full. That is fantastic. All right. Um, let me see what I. All right. So we got dinner for 11 every night for 25 years or so going there while we were all growing up. Um, I kind of missed a lot of the logistics when there was 11 because I was a little guy, but the, you definitely split up the chores amongst. Oh, everybody had a chore. Uh, um, DJ, DJ had to do the kitchen floor, right? Oh, he always had to do the kitchen floor and he was really <clears throat> annoyed would be a nice word to say of me uh, because I would say, you missed a spot, you missed a spot. 
But uh, anyway, they, they would have to set the table. Somebody would have to make the gravy. Somebody, I mean, uh, one day my daughter-in-law came in and she sees me at the last trying to do a dozen different things at once. And she said, oh, you have that problem too. I said, well, nobody can do it all at the last, last minute by themselves. You have lots of things that have to come together at the very end. And that's why when you have a lot of children, it helps. But when the children are away and you're doing the dinner party and you haven't got all the help, it's kind of chaotic. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, Laura said in the cooking vamp a couple weeks ago that she's missing uh, skin on her knuckles from peeling potatoes. I think <laughs> that was the first thing you, you gave a kid a chore to do. I don't know. Um, my potato peeling story is a little off, but I love to tell it. My father went in the Navy and uh, they said, uh, and he had KP leave. And they said, who can peel potatoes? Nobody answers. The guy asked again, who can peel potatoes? And he raises his hand and said, I can. They said, good, you're in charge. The rest of you start peeling <laughs> potatoes. And all these guys are saying, well, I know how to peel potatoes. And they said, well, you didn't raise your arm. So, so he got up. So I learned early to get somebody to peel potatoes so they could say they knew how. <laughs> all right. Um, and then people had to do some of the prep, too. Uh, the green beans, we didn't leave those ends on like they do now. Everybody had to pick the ends off of the green beans or um, shuck the corn. Yeah. And all those kinds of things. I didn't do all those things when no. I was cooking. No, I know you didn't. I have shucking hands. <laughs> Perfectly. My poor dear poor, Bob. Poor, poor Bob. <laughs> um, you know, I have a note in here and I don't know why I have it in my notes. It says, why is chocolate so good? I don't know why it's so good, but it is so good. All right. I decided that um, I could give up a lot of things, but I can't give up chocolate. I'm a chocoholic. <laughs> and, and literally, I have thought at times, well, what does that mean? And it means you have some stashed somewhere. <laughs> when the kids were little, I'd be eating a candy bar or something, they'd come in. Now, this is not a very good place to stash it, but I, I'm caught off guard. So I've got this little thing in the sink that's got the peelings and stuff under there. They'll never look under there. <laughs> but today when I went into my stash that nobody knows I have, except now, uh, you know, I hid it in the suitcase. But All right. don't you dare go get it. <laughs> She's a chocoholic. <laughs> All right. But now the dark chocolate's really good for you. It's as good as wine, so, you know, I don't have to be. <laughs> Here's a good cup. Tom says his job is to stay away from the knives. Who would you say of your children that you thought in the kitchen was just going to be not a good idea to have them there helping out? You, does anybody jump to mind? Matthew. <laughs> Matthew, we used to say, was an accident waiting to happen. Now he's a surgery waiting to happen. <laughs> he used to be an accident waiting to happen. He, he's, Matt is the official bionic person. Um, there's there's less of real mat than there is a fake mat that they've put in knees hips shoulders are shoulders nice. yeah all right um, Lynn says she's searching your room right now for your stash. <laughs> <laughs> all right so you got it all right very nice Ivy's grandma made made hit made honey for everybody see that's part of it. Uh, and and I, again, I pointed out with Laura's uh, spree cast that we did and the book Outliers that I've mentioned before about the community in Rosetto, Pennsylvania, not only did they eat together lots and lots and lots, but they gardened and they, they shared each other's lives together as a community. They said it was hard to walk down the street in Rosetto, Pennsylvania um, and get home at any reasonable hour because so many people would be on a front porch and you would engage and talk to them and you know 15 minutes to this neighbor and 15 minutes to that neighbor pretty soon you're late for dinner um so yeah that, that whole community building portion of cooking you know growing um preparing even as far as mrs seisel going to the wholesome bread right. company mm -hmm. right she bought in uh, she only had five or six children but she bought in much larger quantities than she was dealing in the neighborhood <clears throat> right 
and if you need anything, Mrs. Sison's got it. I tell you, it doesn't matter what it was. She had it, and and it was really nice not to have to get in the car sometimes and drive somewhere. Right. It was just knowing that somebody was there and willing and glad to share. Right. All right, fantastic. All right, we're going to go on to the interview uh, portion that we do when we have a guest on, and they're, they're pretty much the same questions. So uh, that's, that's what we do here at Manja TV. So question number one on the scripted podcast questions. Um, tell me about your ethnicity and if it played a role growing up regarding food. Well, I my father was all Irish, and my mother was part Irish and part Czechoslovakian, and so there were some things that she cooked that I know had that kind of ethnic in it. Um, but my father also came from the South, so we had a lot of you know, like white gravy and beans cooked to death. <laughs> I mean, to death. I think they put the beans. Green beans I'm talking about, that's supposed to be a little crunchy. Mm, first thing in the morning, put on the green beans. However, they did put bacon in with them, so that made the uh, overcooked bean okay. Um, but um, my mother was not a gourmet cook, so maybe if she'd come from France or somewhere, I'd have more gourmet in me. But her gourmet meal was... Veal steak, which veal steak is expensive today. Yeah, it's a veal steak is a. But, but I don't know why it was cheaper then. And then she put a can of tomato soup, thanks Campbell's, over it, and a can of peas. Not nice big, but no, nice no, like the, yeah, the food. And that awesome. was our gourmet dinner, which we didn't get a lot of, but you know, once okay. in a while. And now I think of these fancy dinners, so I never learned that. But so when you were growing up, your mother did the cooking. Yes, later we had help, and then they did the help. Um, the help. So who taught you how to cook? I would say the one that taught me the most was Angie. She was a woman that worked for us. But Angie would say, well, you know how to do that. You can just tell by the feel of it. I said, Angie, you can tell by the feel of it. I, I feel what from now to next week. I don't know what it's supposed to feel like. But she would be patient with me and show me and... Uh, so she was one that, and some relatives taught me, don't cook that way. I mean, right. especially with the green beans. I mean, oh, man, those overcooked green beans, I just hate today. Yeah, I thought that was traditional Irish cooking. <laughs> it is. Cook it unrecognizable and then salt and pepper the hell out of it. <laughs> oh, there are other spices between. <laughs> yeah. no, I've coffee. been to Ireland since, and they are fantastic on the culinary front there. So I, but I don't they know. just learned that, honey. They might have. <laughs> Um, question three, have you ever laughed so hard that you blew milk or soda through your nose? I'm sure I have, but I'm trying to think when. Some kid must have done something, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, in rehearsal you said it wasn't through the nose that you were worried about laughing. <laughs> <laughs> now, you weren't supposed to tell that on this program. <laughs> That's for the late night show. Right, absolutely. All right. Um, have you ever tried to impress a man by cooking them a meal? I love asking this of a near 90-year-old woman. <laughs> oh, I tried a lot of times. Sometimes the impression wasn't what I wanted. <laughs> yeah. When I cooked um, for your father, and we were at the farm, and I made, so I don't know what I made to begin with, but I made this gravy, which I thought was delicious. And he called it. Well, it's not bad if you need some Hawkins paste. Now, Hawkins paste was something you used to do the wallpapering with. <laughs> so I knew I had come a bit short. <laughs> and uh, Hawkins paste gravy. Yes. You know, actually, with the right marketing campaign, I think we might be able to sell that. <laughs> Hawkins paste gravy. Just thin it out a little bit. <laughs> All right. Um, what is your least favorite food? Hmm. Vegetables. <laughs> I mean, I have a whole bunch in there. Although I must confess, I, I like them a little better than I used to. But I could have lived a life with uh, meat, and potatoes. potatoes. They're a vegetable, but they're different. And uh, 
And chocolate. <laughs> Meat, <laughs> potatoes, and chocolate. The Betty Heffernan diet. <laughs> Again, with the right marketing, with the right marketing, I think we can go places with this. Um, do you remember the best restaurant meal you've ever had? Now, we got a lot of restaurant meals here that she's got to try yeah. to filter through. So, Is Brian listening? <laughs> <laughs> That's my son who owns a restaurant, our own one. Um, I have to say, because it was so different, I went to Rana Japan's once, and I was mesmerized by their cooking and everything right there, and it was delicious. So All I right. Say that was my I am not going to argue with Rana Japan, man. I've had some fantastic meals at, at Rana, and you're right. The whole thing, if you're not right. used to it, the... It was fascinating. For sure. All right. Um, now we're going to go to the speed round. Let's see how Betty does at our speed round. All right, I'm gonna give you two items and you pick one of them. Well, and I don't want either one. Then you can say neither or you can say chocolate. <laughs> well, that'll be easy. All right, all right, here we go. Chicken or fish? I used to say chicken, but now I'm saying fish because Brian taught me how to love fish. All right, uh, shrimp or lobster? Lobster. Soup or salad? This is going to go against what I said. Damn it. I do like salads. Mom, it's the speed round. Oh, salads. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> St steak or stew? Steak so rare that I order it. A good vet could save it. <laughs> so that's one way she orders it? So rare a good vet could save it. And what was the other one? Uh, Any, what was the other one? Anybody? A, a steak so rare, a good vet can save it, or... What was the other one? I just... <laughs> John is Marcus. I just walked away through I don't, I don't remember um, the other one. That one was a it. showstopper, though. How rare would you like it? So a good vet could save it. And sometimes I get a very funny look from the waiter. All right. But they get the idea. <laughs> Wine or beer? Wine. Ugh, beer. Ugh. All right. Uh, male dog or female dog? Uh, female dog. I don't like, I mean, I only I like don't. female horses. Oh, say that again. <laughs> male dog or female dog? How about a hot dog? Hot <laughs> dog. <laughs> All right. You know, I'm, out here in Oregon, I am thinning for a Chicago hot dog. I got to tell you that right now. Um, gin or vodka? It's kind of the same to me. All right, she's going chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Beets or carrots? Beets. Uh, bourbon or rye? Bourbon, my she's father's from, from the she's south. She's from Kentucky. Bath or shower? Depends on how much I ache. I like a shower, but if I'm aching, I like a soak. Bath with chocolate. All right. Diner or five-star restaurant? Five-star restaurant. Five-star. Goose or duck? I thought it was duck, duck, goose. <laughs> I think she goes duck then. Duck? Yeah, I'm not, I don't know that. Well, I've had a goose, but not what you're talking about. <laughs> it's a Wonderful Life or Miracle on 34th Street. Uh, does the miracle give me chocolate? Yes, it does. <laughs> absolutely. Cook or eat? Um. I used to like to cook, but now I'd surely rather eat, and fortunately, they let me do that. But, you know, nobody can argue with the fact that Ma just gets to eat now, after 100,000 mouths. All right, um, what is your go-to phrase when the wheels come off in the kitchen? Oh, shit. <laughs> in fact, I know this to be true. Because she said it so often, her sister gave her a necklace one year for Christmas, that was gold and said, "Oh shit!" So what? she didn't even have to. She didn't have to say it anymore. She just pulled a <laughs> necklace out. All right. Was there or is there a food-related question that you wanted me to ask that I didn't? Hmm. No. <laughs> no. No. Why don't you buy me more chocolates? <laughs> Let's talk just briefly, um, because I, my mom's a big fan of the rub, and 
I don't have to pinch her or anything to talk about. Uh, new mothers, new people that are learning how to cook, um, and and the rub. Oh, I really, it's a godsend, I think, because you can put it on any, everything. And if you don't have a, a cupboard full of spices, you just sprinkle a little, little add on, on a potato, on the vegetable. And I prefer the uh, sweet rub. But, you know, that's it. There's two kinds. And if people like it spicier, you can use a spicier one. But um, when you grill vegetables, sprinkle of that on it. And uh, I think almost everybody today has a grill of some sort. If it's not in the uh, stove or outside, you can get a George Foreman. George, are you going to pay me for that? <laughs> <laughs> we got to get George Foreman on this. Hashtag George Foreman. Um, yeah, I think that's important, though. That I mean, you're 90 years old. You learn how to cook. People, you know, you got to learn. Find find your your group of people. Sponge off of them. Ask them questions. Share your food. Um, and, and, and don't be afraid to try something new. I mean, look, at, I said I used to like corn. Now I like asparagus. I used to like chicken. Now I like fish. That didn't come by just eating corn and, and chicken. I, I tried other things. And I really like when they uh, season it differently now. And I never used to like that at all. But it really broadens your... Uh, horizons. Yeah. I wanted to finish with one thing because we got to try this. When, when, what, when, when, when I died? When you brought or made the mock chicken legs. We used to have these things called mock oh. chicken legs because apparently at some point in our history, chicken was very expensive. Yes? I don't know if it was expensive. My mother must have had some pork and some veal and she wanted to make something different. I don't know what. That's so pork cutlet, veal, chopped into about inch square. Yeah, inch, inch and a half. Onto mm -hmm. a skewer. Uh, well, we had wooden sticks. We didn't have those fancy screwers, screwers <laughs> like you do. And uh, you brown it in bacon grease. My son's wife asked him what he wanted for dinner, and he said, mock chicken legs, how do I fix it? Call my mother. And she said, she said to cook it in bacon grease. That's not right. He said, what do you think make it taste so good? Cook it in. <laughs> oh, well, first, before you cook it, you put it in a little mixture of uh, real fine cornmeal and flour. And manja rub. And my, yeah. All right, we're going to kick this 50-year-old recipe up a notch now. Right. That sounds great. Doesn't I'm, it? <laughs> I'll be for dinner. What time? <laughs> right. I'm, I'm all over it. Sounds so good. mock chicken legs. Uh, we'll get that up on the on the blog. Um I'll put that recipe up because it's fantastic. My chicken legs with mashed potatoes and gravy. Oh, <laughs> oh forget about it. All right, somebody bring me the champagne. Champagne. We are, we're going to just have a toast here and let you all go. Um, I know that we talked about the, the, the Valentine's vamp and no, it's, it should, it's right in the fridge. Um, I, Love to hear some stories about people's uh, successes and fails on. <laughs> you see how dirty her mind is? Well, you didn't, I didn't even say, know how to I say success. I didn't say success. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. Well, I didn't get a lemon shoulder by being shy. Valentine's <laughs> successes and failures. Here, I'll open it. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, we talked about how your senses are accentuated by all the sights and sounds and pay attention to all those five senses. Careful, all right. break the light. Careful on the set. <laughs> I've got my mouth open a mile. Sorry. Oh! <laughs> Watch out over yonder. <laughs> so here's a toast to my mom. A hundred thousand mouths fed and going strong. All right. Wow. And today we're filming a live studio audience. Woo! Listen more. I love you, Mama. I love you too. Cheers, Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. We'll see you all next week. Hey, do yourself a favor. Cook somebody a meal, would you?
do everybody a favor and start a Sunday dinner rotation. God bless oh, you all. That's great. That's great. All right. That's it. We'll see you next week.